How do you acquire knowledge? There are lots of things that you think you know, but how did you get to know them? Seems like kind of an important question. After all, if a dodgy email scammer told you they could for definite make you a millionaire overnight if you just give them your bank details, you might be a little skeptical. Where you get your information really matters. In the 18th century, there were two camps of philosophers. On one side, you had the empiricists, who thought that if you want to get knowledge, you have to experience the world. If you want to know how big elephants are, or how hot the sun is, you have to go and check. Maybe do an experiment, or take a measurement. On the other side, you had the rationalists, who thought that the only way to get real knowledge was to figure it out. You can know without doing any kind of experiment that two and two makes four, and that all bachelors are unmarried. Those things are certain. Those are the sorts of things the rationalists thought were knowledge. Their reasoning was that your senses can deceive you. If you do an experiment or take a measurement, you could be hallucinating, or you could have got it wrong. That's why they thought real knowledge had to have the kind of certainty that these ideas do. Into the middle of this debate between the rationalists and the empiricists came Immanuel Kant, who kind of took a middle road. Kant thought that there were some concepts you have in your head that you couldn't have got by experiencing the world. But you also couldn't have just sat down and figured them out either. Take the concept of space, for instance, as in distance between objects. You rely on that concept a lot when you're walking around the world. Imagine a baby experiencing the world for the first time. They couldn't go, oh, that object is over there, and I'm over here, so there must be space in between. Because in order to say that object is over there, you must already have the concept of space in your head. You couldn't have gotten it by experiencing the world. But at the same time, you couldn't have just sat down and figured it out either. It's not like two and two is four or all bachelors are unmarried. There's nothing definitionally true about space. So what Kant realized was that some concepts like space, he also included number and time, must be built into us from the beginning. Our brains must be hardwired to experience the world in that way. As soon as the baby is experiencing anything, they're experiencing it spatially. These synthetic a priori concepts, as he called them, must be a condition of having a mind. All minds have them. This might all seem a little bit overwhelming and technical, so I like to explain it using Pokemon. You can go out into the world and capture new knowledge. You can experience food and music and love and gain knowledge about those things. But you always get a starter Pokemon and a few Pokeballs to get you on your way. And you can't begin your journey towards being a Pokemon master until you've picked your starter. So your synthetic a priori concepts are like your starter Pokemon. This is called a transcendental argument. Now, Kant loves to throw around the word transcendental, but don't be scared of it. A transcendental argument is when we say, okay, we do things like this, so whatever the background conditions are that are necessary for us to do those things, those conditions must be true. Transcendent, in this case, just means going beyond what we have in front of us. So Kant thought that some concepts, like space and time, were built into you as a condition of having a mind, and we have to experience the world like that. But, and go with me here, if you have to experience the world in those ways, then how do you know that the world is really like that? Your synthetic a priori concepts are like a pair of glasses that you can never take off. So how do you know that space and time and all that are really part of the world, and not just in your head. What would the world of Pokemon be like if you never became a Pokemon trainer? You just experienced it directly. And this leads us to one of Kant's most famous and important bits of philosophy. He takes the whole world and divides it into two halves. On one hand, you've got the world as we experience it. He called that the phenomenal world. But on the other hand, you've got the world as it is in itself, independent of anybody's experience. He called that the noumenal world, and we can never experience the noumenal world, because as soon as you experience something, it's part of the phenomenal world. The noumenal world might not have space and time, and all the things that are so fundamental to the way we experience the phenomenal world. It might have them, but it might not. 
This distinction between the noumenal and the phenomenal world is key to understanding so much of Kant's work, particularly what he had to say about free will and God, which, don't worry, I won't bother you with that today. So just remember, certain ways of obtaining knowledge are built into you, so knowledge is as much a feature of you as it is a representation of the world. What do you think? Do human beings have synthetic a priori concepts? Leave me a comment telling me what you thought. And for more philosophical videos, don't forget to subscribe. And if you'd like to support me bringing education to YouTube, you can find Philosophy Tube on Patreon. This episode was filmed in YouTube Space London as part of YouTube's Next Up Creator Camp. Massive thank you to Phil from The Phil Green Show, to Maggie from Red Ted Art, and to Birdkeeper Toby for being in it with me. You can find links to all of their channels below. Yeah.